think about a firefighter, what do they look like? I bet most of you are thinking of someone a bit like this. Well, those of you with experience might be thinking of someone more like this. <laughs> but I doubt very much you'd be thinking of someone who looks like me. But I became a firefighter when I was 18 here in Cardiff. And now, with 17 years of operational service, I'm a Deputy Assistant Commissioner in London Fire Brigade. Now, I might not look like a traditional firefighter, and to be honest, I've had to push back against those stereotypes for my entire <coughs> career. But in a way, the freedom to be different, and I mean really different, has been incredibly empowering. Because when you're free to be different, you're free to define new boundaries, define your own boundaries. And I drew these boundaries around keeping firefighters safe. Now, I want you to humour me a minute. I want you to close your eyes. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you hold hands or sing Kumbaya. <laughs> Trust me. Just close your eyes and think about your home. Now, imagine coming home after a long day. Imagine the faces of the people you love greeting you at the door. Now step inside, into your home. Look at the pictures on the wall. Everywhere you look, there's memories. The spot where the kids took their first steps. The spot where Granny sat on her 88th birthday bash. The spot where the old dog sits on the sofa when he used to be a little puppy. But it's not just a house or a flat or a room. It's your home. OK, you can open your eyes now. This, this is my home. Or at least it's what my little girl think home looks like. And it's packed with stuff. Toys, books, trinkets that I'm too sentimental to throw away. When you put all those things together, along with the memories attached to them, then it becomes your home. I've seen hundreds of versions of this throughout my career. One minute it's there, your home, your memories, your life. The next minute, it's all gone. All gone like that. Now I want you to picture yourself standing on the side of the road in the middle of the night, watching in disbelief as those flames rip through that home that you've just been picturing, through everything you have and love. Imagine someone you love stood next to you as you're both wrapped up in blankets as that acrid smoke swirls around you. Imagine their faces. Now imagine the damp collar of your pyjama shirt as it sticks to your neck as the tears roll down your face. The pavement's cold against your bare feet, but still, at least you got out. Some people aren't so lucky. In fact, more than 9,000 people a year are trapped inside fires. That's the equivalent to the population of St Ives. Now I want you to imagine you're here. This is what you see. It's burning hot. You try and breathe, but you choke on the thick black smoke. You try and shout for help, but you cough and splutter. The taste of that acrid smoke sticks to the back of your teeth. It's roaring flames, they're deafening, but you just make out the sound of someone you love outside the house as they're screaming your name, desperate to reach you, desperate for some sign that you're alive. And you know what they're thinking, because to be honest, it's what you're thinking too. What if we've seen our last birthday together? What if we last, laughed our last laugh together? What if our last memory together has already been made? In one word, how do you think you'd feel right now? Terrified? Hopeless? Lost? Perhaps firefighters are on their way to you. In fact, around 700,000 times every year, people in the UK ask firefighters to help them. They ask to be rescued, to be reunited with their loved ones, the person trapped inside that burning building, or in the crumpled up car, or drowning in a lake. They ask to be helped. So, we rely on our firefighters to go into situations that are fraught with danger, that are dangerous enough to kill. And that's a big responsibility. And it's commanders like me who are in a privileged position to be trusted by firefighters to pull it all together, to know what to do, to make sure the right people are in the right place at the right time to save a life. Now, of the people trapped in fires last year, there were exactly 9,216. Uh, of those people, we rescued exactly 8,890 of them. And one thing that all firefighters have in common, regardless of shape or size, is for those people we rescued, we were the last thing standing between a dying breath and another day. We came to symbolize hope, relief, and a way out. And we're always aware of the inherent risks of our job. We know that it's dangerous. We know that sometimes it won't only be your lives at risk, but ours too. So what drives us to run in when you're running out? Well, we've seen people who are loved, who are echoes of ourselves, lose everything. We've seen the fear and grief, 
and lost in their eyes in real time. And that's what pushes us through the heat and smoke and darkness. And we can't always promise a way out, but where there is one, we promise we'll do everything we can to help you find it. Even when keeping that promise comes at a price, even when it means risking our own safety. Because firefighters want to protect you, that's their job. I want to protect firefighters so they can protect you. That's my job. Now, years of experience and a few close calls have taught me we're not invincible. We have the same fears and flaws as the people we rescue, the same human instinct that drives us to push through the most unforgiving of circumstances and the same human limitations. And you know what? Sometimes we get hurt. Last year, 2,516 firefighters were injured during the course of their duty in England alone. That's enough firefighters to fill 32 double-decker buses and 130 of them suffered major injuries. First time I saw a colleague injured was at one particular fire etched in my memory nearly 15 years ago. That incident would go on to drive a hugely significant piece of research aimed at driving firefighter safety. This is my husband Mike and our daughter Gabriella. Now before we were married we were both firefighters together on neighbouring stations. One day I was part of a crew that was called to an incident where a firefighter had been severely burned. That incident only involved one fire engine and I knew Mike was on it. There was a one in four chance it was him. I can remember walking into the appliance bay as I heard the bells ring and a couple of the guys were already at the teleprinter and they were all kind of huddled around this slip of paper. And I could just tell by their faces that something wasn't right. They told me what it was as I pulled on my boots and yanked the braces up over my shoulders. And as I reached for my jacket and put my arm into the sleeve, I could hear the murmur of voices, but I, I couldn't decipher the words. I felt completely detached, like you're in a film and the camera pans all around you. I can remember thinking to myself, I might be about to become one of those people we see every day who wake up to cornflakes and normality only for their entire world to be ripped apart. The journey there was the longest four and a half minutes of my life. All I could think about was Mike. Is it him? Was he hurt? Was he afraid? <laughs> it was literally all I could think about. I was torn between the role of a loved one and the role of a responder. Anyway, we pulled up and I jumped off the truck and I could see this pair of legs sticking out from a huddle of firefighters with kind of dirty patches on the knees. And all I could hear was someone groaning like they were in pain. And then I think, Honestly, I was about to throw up when I saw Mike stand up um, and the scene spun and I felt this overwhelming sense of relief. I couldn't feel my legs moving as I ran towards the crowd with a, a medikit and an oxygen cylinder in, my hand, cylinder in my hand. And I bit down on my lips so hard to stop myself from crying that I still got a scar inside there to this day. But then I did what a firefighter is supposed to do. I joined my crew and we dealt with the scene. Now, that incident was so challenging and in a sense I was really lucky because Mike wasn't hurt but someone else was and for a long time that incident played on my mind and I had a huge sense of guilt that I carried for a very very long time because I'd felt relief when another man who we considered to be our friend as well as our colleague had been so badly injured. For the entire journey there, I'd crossed my fingers that Mike wasn't hurt, and by not wanting it to be him, I felt like I'd wished it on someone else. So someone else's family had that phone call, rushed to the hospital, lived through the months of recovery, the tears, the angry outbursts, the rebuilding of a life. Mike avoided it, as did I, but someone else didn't. Which brings me to an important question. Who's responsible for keeping firefighters safe? Who's responsible for preventing incidents like the one I just described? Whose job is it to prioritise firefighter safety so they can prioritise yours? Interestingly, 80% of firefighter injuries are caused by human error. Though that's the equivalent to 25 of those double-decker buses. Those injuries 80% of them, think about it, 80% of them are caused not by a failure of a piece of equipment or by an inadequate policy or a flawed procedure, but by a human mistake. Those injuries, so many of them caused by a failure to process information properly or a misjudged decision, the wrong choice in the wrong place at the wrong time, and real people were getting hurt as a result. That was incredible. Now, don't get me wrong, human error is not necessarily a reflection on an individual's ability, 
Sometimes it reflects the circumstances or just the fundamental limitations of being human. But what causes human error in the fire service? What affects our ability to make effective decisions when we're working in high pressured, highly stressful situations? And how do we improve our chances of doing exactly that? Well, the key word here is human. You have to understand the boundaries of being human in order to push the boundaries of being human. Now, I started exploring this and it became painfully obvious that there'd been very little work done with fire. We were woefully behind other high-risk industries like medicine and aviation who'd been working to reduce human error for decades. And I knew this was important and I wasn't going to just sit on the sidelines waiting for someone else to fix things. So I decided to plow my own furrow. But this wasn't straightforward. When I was 15, I was homeless. I did my GCSEs, my final exams while I was sleeping rough. And I sold the big issue for about another two years, earning just enough for something to eat each day. So continuing with my education wasn't a luxury that I could afford. Then I joined the fire service when I was 18. So by the time the time came when I wanted to make a meaningful contribution, I didn't have the right qualifications to make a difference, or at least not at first. So I sucked it up, I put one foot in front of the other, and I got on with it. I started off by doing a psychology degree with the Open University. I specialised in behavioural neuroscience, eventually completing a PhD at Cardiff University, all part-time, all while I was still serving full-time. Now, that was hard work. It was very hard work, especially because I had a newborn baby somewhere along the way. But I was just determined to bridge that gap between the academic and the practical. So I wanted to look at the, the well, I wanted to look at what cues our decisions and the circumstances that affect them. So for nearly the past decade now, I've been working with a research group at Cardiff University, where we've been painstakingly examining the decisions that incident commanders are making all over the country. Not in a lab, but in the field, at real life incidents, life-saving decisions. Now we've worked in the field, we've pulled people's brains apart using virtual reality, we've replicated it all on a training ground, and even burned down some old buildings in the name of science. I've broken a few things along the way. <laughs> but we pulled apart people's decisions and pieced them back together again, only better. And what we now know is this, most of the decisions that people make at incidents are intuitive decisions, not reflective analytical decisions as was previously thought. Now, these are distinct separate processes that happen in distinct and separate parts of the brain. But interestingly, these decisions, the analytical decisions, only happen 20% of the time. However, until we did this work, our policies only acknowledged those analytical decisions. But those models would be used to retrospectively scrutinise and judge how good our decision would be 100% of the time. Now, these kind of decisions are normal and natural. So for us, it was really important to be able to look at how we could help commanders when they were using intuitive processes and not just analytical processes. Now, fires are stressful, even to firefighters, even to commanders, and this stress affects the way that you think. It reduces the processing capacity in your brain and it can hamper your decisions as a result. So the truth is a commander's got more chance of making a mistake at an incident because they've got more chance of misjudging something or missing something or responding in a suboptimal way. And for us, that means people can get hurt. So we needed to focus on how we could help commanders focus on operational goals despite stressful situations. To do this, we looked at their awareness, their situational awareness. And we found that when they were making decisions on the incident ground, their mental picture, their awareness of the situation was very limited to the here and now. They weren't anticipating or thinking about what might happen next. All really interesting results. So we used these results to develop some new techniques that would help to reduce human error and make their decisions more effective. 
We used the findings to develop this. This is our decision control process and it recognises both analytical and intuitive brain processes. And once commanders had made a decision using one of these two pathways, we trained them to ask themselves three very simple questions. What's my goal? What do I expect to happen? And is the benefit worth the risk? Now, we tested the, these decision controls out on some national decision trials, and we found that they really helped commanders to focus on the operational goals, despite the challenging situations they were in. We also found that they improved their situational awareness, pushing the commanders past the limits of what's happening right now and towards the realms of what's going to happen. And crucially, they didn't slow down decision making. Now, these techniques are now used as standard all across the UK and we've shared them beyond international borders. Not only are they embedded in our national command policy for fire, but they're also in the command policy for all emergency <coughs> services. So we all now benefit from these results. Now, my experience, my guilt, I suppose, drives me to push on, to continue researching, to make the working environment of firefighters better for people who I'm proud to call my colleagues and sometimes I'm lucky enough to call them my friends. So although I've not had a traditional journey, I've certainly had the freedom to be different. And when you're free to be different, you're free to define new boundaries. It only takes one person to change a mind, but many minds can change the world. Thank you.